Once again, our sermon meditation is based on the gospel lesson today. You can find that on the bottom of page 5. Galatians 3, verses 26 through 28. All right, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free. There is neither male or female. For you all are one in Christ Jesus. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, dear fellow redeemed blood-bought souls. Harry, wake up! Harry, wake up! Wake up! Ron Weasley called out from the Gryffindor common room. Harry, get up! As we see young Harry, we realize off the bat he does absolutely nothing as Ron Weasley calls out to him to get up. He's in no rush. He's in no hurry. Even if it was Christmas, that meant nothing to Harry. Because Harry had a really difficult young life. Harry didn't have any parents. He was raised by his aunt and uncle who would make the stepmother of Cinderella look like Mary Poppins because they mistreated him every single step of the way. <clears throat> Harry didn't get presents for Christmas. Harry didn't get presents for his birthday. Meanwhile, his cousin got 37 presents on his birthday, and that wasn't anywhere near enough. No, young Harry had to grow up, spending most of his young life, living in the room, that was actually a broom closet, under the staircase. And for Harry's birthday, he had to celebrate by etching into the dust of the ground his own birthday cake with his name and candles to be blown out on it. So why on earth, as Ron calls out to Harry, Harry, hurry up, wake up, it's Christmas, what did he have to rush for? <laughs> Harry never got to wake up to a Christmas with presents under the Christmas tree with his name on it. He never got to wake up on Christmas to a family waiting to show him love and affection. Those things were never there for Harry. But this year is going to be different. Young Ron Weasley called out from the Gryffindor common room, Harry, wake up, you have presents. If you've ever watched the movie before, Harry quickly throws those glasses on, whips the blanket off, and sprints down the stairs. And Ron wasn't lying. There were presents under the Christmas tree with his name on it, but, but probably even cooler than that, maybe even the most remarkable moment of that Christmas was when young Harry looked down at Ron and he asked him, what are you wearing? Because Ron had a big sweater with a large R, first initial of his name on it. And he told Harry, oh, my mom made these for everyone in the family. They're, they're hand-knit sweaters for everyone in the family. And oh, by the way, she made one for you. You can imagine the joy and happiness and excitement for Harry. he just met the Weasleys a couple months before that, didn't know him for very long. And yet they treated him like he was a part of the family. Because to them, he was a part of the family. Now I know I don't want to burst any of your bubbles, but I know and realize and recognize that this is the story of Harry Potter, a fictional tale. The Wizarding World of Harry Potter is not real life. But I couldn't help but see the connections and commonalities to our gospel lesson for today, the story of the wise men. And I'm not here to tell you that the wise men were magicians or wizards, because that's not the case. But remember who these men were and what they did. <clears throat> remember these men, of course, the first thing we hear about them is their wives, right? They're astrologers, star studiers, ones who were most likely well-educated, considered intellectuals at their time. Based on their gifts, we can tell that it seems like they're wealthy, like they got a lot of money, they got a lot of things, they, they're pretty well off. What else do we know about these wise men? Of course, the common myth is that there are three. Why do we always say three? Say that there's one per each gift, right? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But the reality is we don't know how many there, of them there were. Could have been two, could have been 22. The Bible does not specify. But remember what it does tell us about the Magi, where they're from. The Magi from the east, from Babylon, from Persia, not from Jerusalem. Remember what that meant, that these men were not Jewish. These men were not of the line of the Messianic promise. 
We heard about the shepherds receiving this news. Jews, commoners. But now today, and there's that reason why the epiphany of our Lord, and especially as we look at this account, that this day has been called the Gentile Christmas. Because on this day, the Lord saw fit to proclaim the good news that the shepherds had already heard to the Gentiles, to all people. And did you notice, the, we'll get to the ending soon, but did you notice what happened to the wise men? They're not led to little baby Jesus, and they're not told by God, look at this gift, by the way, it's not for you. It's only for the Jews, it's only for some people. No, the message for them is that this gift, this present, this Savior, is for all nations, is for you. Isn't that our story too? Foreigners, Castaways, ones that were cast out from God's family, not because of what God had done, but because of what we had done through sin. And yet God called us back by his grace. God, through his wisdom and glory, revealed himself to us. I want to remind you one thing when it comes to the story of the wise men. If there's one thing you take away, I hope that it's this. The story of the wise men is not about the gifts that they brought that day. It is not about the gifts that the wise men brought that day. The story of the wise men in the season of Epiphany is about the gift that was revealed and that they received that day. The Savior, the present that was waiting for them. Gentile Christmas is your Christmas. It's as if you get to walk down the stairs and see that present, see that baby, see that child wrapped up in cloths. It says, to you from God, a gift that was given for your salvation and for mine. That's a gift that's worth celebrating, but we see in our verses for today, not everyone was celebrating this Gentile Christmas. We see that the one that the wise men went to most certainly was not happy to hear about this news. We read, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi, wise men from the east, came to Jerusalem and asked, Where's the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Imagine what that day was like for the wise men. Astrologers, star studiers, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, appears this miraculous star. This star unlike any other, this star that should not be there. And imagine them fumbling, frantically going to their charts and their tables and their scrolls and their writings and wondering and trying to find information. Yet their world, their science, their study, their wisdom has nothing to say about this star. They have no idea where it comes from. They have no idea what it means. And we can almost imagine the moment that the light bulb clicked. We can almost imagine the wise men gathered around and almost saying to themselves, could it be? Because remember where the wise men were from. The east. From Babylon. Remember who was from Babylon. Remember that that is the place where the, the sons and daughters of Israel were exiled into. One of the most prolific names in Babylon was not a Babylonian. It was King Daniel, right? The one who proclaimed about a light, about a star that would come. Micah proclaimed that this star, this light, would be revealed in Bethlehem. We hear that news told to them. Isaiah and his message could not be any clearer that this light would shine forth, this glory, this wisdom would be revealed to the Lord's people. The book of Numbers talks about this star that would come and would reveal the birth of the king of Israel, the real king of the Jews, the king of all people. You can imagine this message told and retold following the passing of Daniel. And imagine these wise men having heard it. Could it be true? Could that message of the Jewish people that's hung around all this time, could it be real? So what did it lead them to do? It led them to Jerusalem. Why Jerusalem? Well, if you're going to try and find out who the next king of Israel is, why not go to the place where the king of Israel are born? And remember that the current king of the Jews, the self-proclaimed, the puppet king, the king that the Romans had established, King Herod, he was ruling there. So they went with this message that they've seen a star, that they believe that the king of Israel, the real king, has been born. And we see how Herod reacts to that. 
When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. We can imagine how quickly this word spread in Jerusalem, and I want you to think about it this way. Maybe you're like me, and every time you think about Jerusalem during the time of Jesus, you think millions and millions and millions of people. And Jerusalem during the time of Jesus was a Mecca, don't get me wrong. But a lot of people have claimed that maybe the population during Jesus' time, during this time, was no more than about 50,000. And of course, during festivals, more and more hundreds of thousands would come in. But think about that, 50,000. Does that sound familiar? That's about the size of Joplin, right? Mm -hmm. Imagine the caravan of wise men, probably not just coming in by themselves, coming in with camels and goods and, and treasures, coming in down Main Street in Joplin. Imagine how quickly the Joplin Globe would get a hold of that. Imagine how quickly all 50,000 here would hear about that. Imagine if they made their way all the way down to the city hall. That's something that you would find out about, I believe, maybe within minutes. And especially in Jerusalem, this town was filled with terror because the wise men said that there's a real king of the Jews that has been born. And remember what that meant for the commoners. If Herod was terrified, if Herod was distraught, if Herod was angry, those emotions were also felt by the people. Because remember who this ruler was. Remember the nickname that historians have given to Herod? A nickname that, that is reserved for only the best and the brightest and the most wonderful. Names like Alexander the Great. Historians have called him Herod the Great, thinking about the buildings, the architecture, the wonderful things that he has done. But I guarantee that nobody that Herod ruled after or ruled over would ever call him great. Because Herod was a tyrant. Herod was ruthless. He was paranoid. He was, a better nickname might be Herod the Horrible. He's one of the most terrible human beings that has ever existed. Because of what Herod did. Herod cared about Herod. Herod cared about power. Herod cared about the throne. And he cared about nothing else. You want proof? He killed his own family when they possibly or even thought of threatening that position. He killed his wife, he killed his sons, he killed his brother-in-law, he killed his mother-in-law, just to name a few. It's been said that while Herod was about to die, he ordered some of his officials, when he passed, to kill, to execute a large number of people, so that when he passed, if people weren't sad about him dying, they'd sure be sad about their family members dying. That's how horrible a person he is. And yes, he's the one that verses later, when the wise men don't return, he made the edict, he made the order, that any baby boy born in Bethlehem, two years and younger, would be killed. That's the king that is reigning right now, King Herod. So when he finds out about this, we can imagine how terrified the people were. What was this man going to do? Because whether they knew it or not, that's exactly what the wise men were saying by this. As they come up to Herod and say, where's the Messiah? Where's the king of the Jews, whether they knew it or not? They were saying right to Herod's face, Herod, we know you're a puppet king. We know Rome is throwing you up. We even know you're not a real Jew. Where's the real king? Where's the real king of these people? It hit Herod to the heart. So where does he go? He goes to the religious elite. He goes to the teachers of the law. He goes to the people that would know the scriptures. And he asks, where on earth was this Messiah to be born? Notice what they said. They had no problem answering, right? Go to the words of Micah. Out of lowly Bethlehem, the Messiah, that baby, would be born. So Herod tells the wise men, go to Bethlehem, find this child, and when you do, report back to me, so I too may go worship him. We can almost imagine the knife behind his back as he's saying those words. The only worship that he wanted to do was to kill. So he sends the, the men on their way. We know that this story is about the wise men, and, and way more importantly, it's about Jesus, that baby that they went to see. But let's not lose the, the learning that we can receive from the other characters of this story. Think about Herod, and think about the religious lead of the day. These ones knew far more than the wise men ever did about this baby born in Bethlehem. But think about it this way. The ones that knew the most about baby Jesus, the ones that knew the most about where this baby was to be born, didn't see him at all. They saw him the least. And the ones that knew the least about him saw him the most. 
You think about that, those religious elite, if anyone asked during that day if they were believers, they'd say, of course. Which makes us ask ourselves, can we ever be like them? Can we ever claim to be believers and yet not follow it up? Say it in word, yet not follow it up in action? Being Christian in name, yet not actually revere and lift up the name of the Lord in everything that we do? The first thing we think about when we hear that is, why didn't they go? We see the reaction of Herod, and we see the act, reaction of the religious elite, elite. What did they do? Nothing. They never went to see Jesus. And think about it. Bethlehem wasn't a far journey, maybe 5, 10, a stone's throw away down the road. How quickly we think to ourselves, oh, if I was there, if I was alive during Jerusalem, if I didn't have a car at the time, oh, I would have taken a camel, a donkey. If I didn't have that, I would have walked. If I, I would have crawled if I needed to. I would have most certainly made my way to see Jesus. But then we think about it this way. How much we grumble and complain and how difficult it is to take a nice warm shower, to jump in the car, and to drive a couple minutes to the Lord's church. To be with the Lord's house, to be with the Lord's people. How often and how difficult it is to make it to Bible study, to open our Bibles on a weekly basis. How much we make Sunday morning attendance Something that we do for God rather than something he does for us. How often we make our devotionals and Bible studies a checklist of homework rather than something so much greater than that of what God wants to do in serving us. Brothers and sisters in Christ, God doesn't want nominal Christians. God does not want Christians in name. God wants followers who lift up his name above all else. And who actually serve and follow him and love him and put him first in everything they do. And you think about it, the same thing goes for Herod, right? What did Herod want to do with Jesus? He wanted to get rid of Jesus. He wanted to toss him out. If he could throw him in a bag and throw him away, he would have. But we never do that, right? We never want Jesus to not be part of our lives. Do we want Jesus to be a part of our lives? When we're on that date with our boyfriend and girlfriend before marriage and no one else is watching? Do we want Jesus to be a part of our life in the break room at work? Do we want Jesus to be a part of our life when we're alone by ourselves and no one else is watching? Do we want Jesus to be a part of our life on the weekends when it's party time? There's so many times when the king's edicts, when the king's orders, when Jesus will for you in your life doesn't match up with what we want. So we take him off the throne and we set him to the side. I want to remind you all something. You're not a Christian one hour a week. You're not a Christian for one hour Sunday morning and maybe an hour Wednesday night for Bible class and whenever you open your Bibles. And you're not a Christian 51% of the time. You're a son or a daughter of Jesus Christ every single second of your day. Follow the lead of the Magi, setting else, everything else aside. How often we fail to realize that when they went to Herod, they were staring death in the face and said, we need to follow this star at all costs. There's nothing that's going to stop us. Where is this one that is the king of the Jews? So when it comes to being in the Lord's house, when it comes to being around the Lord's people, when it comes to being in the word, there is nothing, no journey, no travels, no inconvenience that can stop us. Because it is the most important thing in our life and a place that we need to be. Notice what happened for the Magi once they left Herod. The star reappeared. Verse 9, after they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. I've always found it ironic, and I fall into the trap myself of calling these men the wise men. No offense to them, but they're really in this story anything but wise. If you take God out of this story, then they're helpless and hopeless wanderers. Think about it. If there's no star, if there's no words of Micah, the prophecy that was given by Herod and the religious leaders, these wise men would have never left Babylon. And when they did leave Babylon, they would have had no idea which house to go to in Jerusalem. Did the wise men find Jesus that day? No. 
God revealed himself to the wise men. God led the wise men to himself. Credit cannot go to them. And the reality is the same goes for us. No matter how long it would take us, no matter how long this scavenger hunt, if it was all on us and apart from God, we would never find him. It's only through his wisdom and through his glory and through his word that we could have him revealed to us. And I want to ask you a question today. What was the star or what was the stars that God used to guide you to him? And, and I'm almost positive that none of you had a, a, a new star pop up in the sky to lead you to the vine or lead you into the word. I, I don't think that happened. What I am talking about is maybe not what is the star that God used, but maybe it is who is the star that God used to reveal himself to you. Maybe it was your parents. Maybe it was mom and dad who realized that they had so much to do as parents. They had so much to teach you. But the greatest thing that they could do is bring you to the feet of your Savior. Maybe it was a friend. Maybe it was a friend that was willing to risk it all. And maybe they didn't just invite you once. Maybe they didn't invite you two or three times. Maybe they invite you a dozen times, and after a dozen no thank yous, they didn't stop because they knew that you needed this light just as bad as they did. And through them, the Lord continued to call you to him. Maybe it was a, a wide range of different things. Maybe it was a devotion on Facebook. Maybe it was a YouTube video. Maybe it was just stumbling upon the word. I don't know what your star was or is, but I want to remind you two things about that star. One, remember who sent that star. Remember who sent the star. The wise men, the astrologers, the star studiers, they didn't conjure it up themselves. Once again, this isn't Harry Potter. God sent that star for them. Think about that. In eternity, God saw fit to make a perfect star, a star just for you, to help guide you to him. Take some time today to maybe think about those stars, thank God for them, and to thank them personally. But then I want to remind you another thing. That star did not save you. Although they're a huge part of your salvation story, they did not bring you into the family of God. That's something only the gospel can do. But they might have led you right to the waters. They might have led you right to the baptismal font. They might have led you right to the feet of the cross. And that's where Jesus did his work. Through water and the word, washing and cleansing and writing his name on your hearts to no longer be a foreigner, but to be a part of the family. No greater, no less than anyone else. Ones who receive the full inheritance of God fully loved by him in every way. How could we possibly react to such love that has been shown to us? By bringing good gifts, right? We follow the lead of the Magi, right? What did they do in response to finding out where Jesus was? They brought their best. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And I'm not here today to tell you to bring gold, frankincense, and myrrh and place it in the offering plate. Tom's not here, our treasurer, but I don't want to speak for him or the elders who count the money. I don't think SMB, the bank, really takes or deals with gold bars anymore. And I think we're all right for frankincense and myrrh here at church. If we need frankincense, we can go to the dollar store and maybe buy some Febreze myrrh. No one uses that anymore. But that's not the point. God wants you to use your time, your talents, your abilities the best of the very best that you have, gifts that are only worthy of the king, to bring them and to lay them at his feet. That's going to look different for every single one of us. But in God's eyes, equally wonderful and enjoyable for him. But remember what God is going to use all of your gifts for. Remember what God wants to do, what the purpose is behind you bringing back everything that he has brought to you to bring more foreigners into the family so that more people may know who the light of the world is. 
Whenever it comes to bringing our brightest and best to God, I cannot help but think of this kid in Arizona, and I know I'm going to think about it for the rest of my life. But brings me back to my vicar year, pastor and training year out in Arizona. Uh, I had the Sunday off. I was sitting in the pew, actually. wasn't preaching, wasn't presiding. And I remember during, right after the sermon was the time when the offering would happen, and they had four ushers that would come down, and they'd pass the offering plates and, and, and receive them from the pew. And I looked down the row, and I remember seeing this little boy, no older than maybe five or six years old. And you can imagine what happened right when the offering started to be gathered. Mom, Mom, Dad, Dad, can I have a couple dollars? Can I have a couple bucks? And of course, Mom and Dad shuffled through the wallet and handed him some cash. And this child was just the happiest kid that you could ever imagine. The biggest smile from year to year. Waving around the money, seeing that he had some cash. But then the elders came to his pew and, and held out the, the, the plates for him to put the money in. And you know what he did? Nothing. He didn't want to give it up. He grasped onto that like a vice grip. No way are these mean old men possibly going to take this money from me. And you can imagine his parents getting redder and redder and redder, nudging him, put it in the plate, put it in the plate. So finally, after enough encouragement from mom and dad, he throws it in the plate, and he goes back and he folds his arm and sits back down. And he watches the ushers go down the row, go down the row, and collect more money. But then he sees the ushers going back, put the money together, and he sees them start walking forward. And he leans over and he nudges mom and dad with tears still running down his face and says, Mom, Dad, where's that mean old man that stole my money? Where, where's he taking it? And they looked at him and, and said, well, he's taking it to Jesus. He's taking it to serve God. And imagine how bright and how big the boy's smile was on his face when he had that money in his hand. Multiply it by five when he realized where that money was going. To serve God and to serve God's people. Whatever gold, frankincense, and myrrh that you have in your life, don't cling to it like that child. Bring it back. Give it to the one that is given to you. In whatever way you possibly can, bring gifts that are the best of the best to the king, to the one that has given them all to you. Serve him so that more foreigners may know what he has done for them. When I think about it, that Gentile Christmas, it hits home because that's my Christmas too. I don't know if you've had family members, I've never done it, but I've had family members do the whole Ancestry.com thing or the 23andMe blood tests. I don't know much about my family, I haven't looked into them too much, but I do realize and know that every single one of those tests came up with 0% Jewish blood. So if it was based on that, I wouldn't be up here right now and I would be a goner. But the story of the wise men, the story of that baby that came for a world full of foreigners to bring them into his fold, to bring them into his family, is my story too. And I know it's your story as well. And when it comes down to it, the Gentile Christmas is the Jewish Christmas too. Because the story is not this, Jesus came for Gentiles or Jesus came for Jews. The story is this, that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, took on flesh for all people. Any single person with a heartbeat, with the breath of life in them, and with a soul. Jesus came and lived and breathed and died and rose again for them so that they could be made a part of his family. How cool it is that the wisdom of God has been revealed to you, has been revealed to me, and is meant to be revealed to all nations. God be praised that we get to be a part of of that glory, of that wisdom being revealed to others, to foreigners, to be brought in the family, that we get to share that message that today in the town of David, a Savior has been born for you. He is Christ the Lord. Amen.